It was 2010, and an off-duty police officer, John Malia, took his German Shepherd dog, Blue, a police cadaver dog, out for a walk on Gilgo Beach, attempting to find the remains of a missing girl, Shannon Gilbert, a 20-year-old prostitute who advertised on Craigslist. She had accepted a job near Gilgo Beach on the south shore of Long Island. She was never heard from again. As Malia and Blue walked the beautiful stretch of beach and dunes on Ocean Parkway, they came across the skeletal remains of a young woman stuffed into a burlap bag. Shock rippled through the quiet bedroom community and then outwards across the nation. This was the first of the women, all sex workers, that were discovered. There were more, a lot more. Between 17 and 20 more, plus two men who all lost their lives at the hands of the Long Island serial killer, who also became known as the Craigslist Ripper and the Gilgo Beach Killer. For more than a dozen years, the Long Island serial killer walked the earth a free man, unidentified and safe in his carefully constructed world. He went to work, raised his children, and lived his double life. Those around him had no idea he had a deep, dark, penetrating obsession and demented fantasy life. Neither those who worked with him, were his clients, called him friend, or even his own wife had a clue of what would be found on his computer or what he did when no one was watching. It would take time to find the victims, more time to identify them, and 13 years to capture the monster responsible for so much senseless loss of life, for leaving mothers and fathers suffering, for leaving a community transfixed with fear. Shannon Gilbert was not found until much later. Her cause of death was strangulation, and there appears to be no evidence to link her to the Long Island serial killer. It appears that all of the adult victims were brought to the island for the same reason, sex for hire. Most, if not all, had their services listed on Craigslist. The first four bodies were all located within close proximity. They were all strangled to death and disposed of in burlap bags and tossed into the dunes. There could be no dispute. There was no room here for coincidence. The Suffolk County Police Commissioner Richard Dorman made the statement, four bodies found in the same location pretty much speaks for itself. It's more than a coincidence. We could have a serial killer. Police combed the area. They began to spread out further and further slowly, and in the end, they discovered the horrifying truth. Commissioner Dormer was correct. There was a serial killer, and he had worked with such precision and for so long, an estimated 20 years, that it was suspected that the killer must somehow have intimate knowledge of police procedures in order to have gone long undetected. Residents long suspected that the killer is retired police. The first four victims found were all identified in January 2010. They are Megan Waterman, 22, of South Portland, Maine, who had gone missing on June 6, 2010. Maureen Brainerd Barnes, 25, of Norwich, Connecticut, last seen on July 9, 2007. Melissa Bartholomew, 24, of Erie County, New York, missing since July 10, 2009. And Amber Lynn Costello, 27, of North Babylon, New York, who had disappeared on September 2, 2010. The bodies were located approximately 500 feet from each other. Murder in Long Island was in no way common, and the grisly details only led to heighten the fear. The investigation continued. The next body was found about a mile from the initial four, Jessica Taylor, 20. She went missing in July 2003 and was found without her head or hands. She could only be identified by using DNA. Later, her skull and hands were found on Gilgo Beach. Three more bodies were found several miles away. One was Valerie Mack, who was not able to be identified until 2020. Another was christened Peaches due to a tattoo on her chest because she was missing her skull and it has never been retrieved. The remains of Baby Doe, a toddler between 18 and 24 months old, were also buried in the sand. The toddler showed no signs of trauma and was believed to be unrelated as it didn't fit into any of the established M.O. of the killer. However, after extensive testing, it was determined she was the child of the victim known as Peaches. One can only assume that Baby Doe was collateral damage. New York State Police joined local and county officials in the investigation. 
In 2015, the FBI, who had unofficially assisted in the case, officially joined the hunt. It has been a long and arduous process. While the cause of death was most frequently strangulation, and in the beginning the handling of the corpse was basically the same to put the body in a burlap bag and unceremoniously dump it into the dunes, he began to dispose of the victims in parts, such as the removing of the skull and hands and body parts, such as legs found in a trash bag, were found strewn over the miles of the beach area. Slowly over the 12 years since the finding of Megan Waterman, the 20 years of serial killings have produced the remains or partial remains of an estimated 20 people. Of these, excluding the toddler, all appear to have been sex workers, small in stature and dark-haired. Two were Asian men, both assumed to be prostitutes, with one appearing to be a transsexual. The victims date to 1996. The men died from blows to the head rather than strangulation. It's curious to consider why. Was he angered when they were male? Or perhaps they were stronger and it would have been too difficult to rely on his method of choice? While no bodies have surfaced since 2011, investigators continued to work the case to both find the killer and identify the victims. Valerie Mack was the last to be named in 2020. During the time of the hunt, the killer was referred to by the police as Joe C. The New York Times reported that the perpetrator is most likely a white man who would have been in his mid-20s to mid-40s when he was active. This man would have had access to the burlap sacks he used to dispose of his first victims. In addition, Joe C. would have to actually live on the island, or at the very least, have intensive familiarity with the South Shore geography. It was thought that since he appeared to have a detailed knowledge of law enforcement techniques, it was possible he even had ties to the police. There have been many who speculated all of the murders were not the result of one man, that the search was for two or more killers. There was belief that the original four bodies were an isolated serial killer and the others could very well be unrelated. This could very well be the case, as it turns out. During the 13-year hunt, a number of suspects surfaced. Newsday reporters speculated that serial killer Joel Rifkin, a former Long Island resident, may have been responsible for some of the older remains found in March and April 2011, with four of the victims' complete bodies having never been found. In an interview with the magazine, Rifkin denied any involvement. At that point, there was no reason for him not to take credit and surprising that he, in fact, wouldn't if he had been the perpetrator. This is still possible. John Bitroff is serving 50 years for the murder of two prostitutes. He was arrested in 2014. His victims' bodies were found in 1993 and 1994, and his conviction was the result of a DNA match. The conviction happened in 2017. The police department has not made a comment regarding any involvement in this case, as it is still ongoing. Bitroff's attorney has denied his involvement. It is possible he is responsible for some of the later victims. Mitroff lived in Manorville, a mere three miles from where the torsos of Jessica Taylor and Valerie Mack were recovered. He was a hunter who enjoyed the killing of animals. In addition, he was a carpenter by trade and not only had access to various saws, but the skills to use them in order to precisely dismember kills. And finally, the adult daughter of Rita Tangridi, one of his victims, was best friends with Melissa Bartholomew, who was one of the Gilgo Beach deaths. Bartholomew's mother said that her daughter had a lot of calls to Manorville before her murder. However, he is not responsible for any of the Gilgo Four. The other most interesting suspect is James Burke. Burke is a former Suffolk County police chief, so he fits the qualification of being aware of official police procedures. Burke is a suspect for more than one reason that leads him to the case. First off, he is reported to have blocked an FBI probe of the case during the time he was an active police chief. He served 46 months in federal prison for assault and conspiracy after he violently assaulted a man in custody who had a stolen duffel bag from Burke's police vehicle. The duffel contained sex toys, pornography, and Viagra. Shannon Gilbert's family attorney also reported in December 2016 that an escort, Leanne, he had spoken to, suspected that Burke was connected with the case. 
She told a story about attending a party on Oak Beach and had seen Burke there. He dragged a woman she assumed to be Asian by her hair to the ground. Leanne saw Burke at another party later that year and decided to have sex with him. She described how Burke had violently yanked her head during oral sex so hard that she tensed up. She detailed how Burke had been unable to reach orgasm and afterwards he tossed a few hundred dollars at her. At that time, she was not a sex worker. How interesting is it that Burke assumed she was? It is possible that Burke had something to do with some of the lost girls on Long Island, some of those who were dismembered, for instance, but not the Gilgo Four. And how do we know this? Because just last week, the Long Island serial killer was captured. He has been charged with murdering at least three of the Gilgo Four. Who is he? And how was he captured after more than a decade? This is the point where truth becomes more interesting, intricate, and time-consuming than even the very best episode of Law & Order. The Long Island serial killer is Rex Heuerman, a 59-year-old Nassau County architect. What has long been known is that an eyewitness saw Amberlynn Costello get into a Chevrolet avalanche with a hulking man described as having a face like an ogre. Cell phone records indicated that some of the victims had vanished in the Massapequa Park area. Investigators had looked for owners of this Chevrolet model and similar ones that matched the description. Doing so brought them to suspects based on that witness account, but it was detailed cell phone records that enabled them to narrow down the search and make the arrest. Subpoenas allowed them to search Hewerman's cell phone records, which determined that his personal phone was never far from the burner phones used to contact the Long Island serial killer victims, and that most of the calls originated from locations near where Hewerman either lived or worked. This took only six weeks, 42 days. It could have been accomplished a decade ago. An award-winning 2020 Netflix documentary, Lost Girls, had a recurrent theme of how the Suffolk County police were indifferent to the crimes. At one point, as discussed previously, James Burke in fact sent away an FBI team that had been brought in to assist. It was a confusing decision until it was determined that Burke was under investigation himself for beating up a suspect who stole the duffel bag full of secrets from his SUV. He served 46 months and, as mentioned, was in fact a suspect. This film and 2016 documentary The Killing Season have illuminated that the case went unsolved in no way due to a lack of evidence, but rather there just wasn't enough interest. They didn't care, because the women were thought to be inconsequential people, that much like a dirty sheet of paper could be wadded up and thrown away. Why? because they were women and because they were sex workers, and thus somehow seen as less human. It wasn't just law enforcement. During a press conference during the original hunt, even a TV crew member was heard to remark, I can't believe they're doing all of this for a whore. However, a new investigation task force was put together in 2022, and Suffolk County District Attorney Ray Tierney took over. They did the work, ignored the past willful cruelty and dismissive nature, and dug in. They took what they had and went on to systematically solve the puzzle, then build the case that brought the arrest of Long Island's most wanted man. The new task force had the identification of the LIK within six weeks of its inception. Investigators went backward through phone records collected from both Midtown Manhattan and the Massapequa Park area. Two areas where a burner was used by the killer were detected. After narrowing down the pool of possibilities, they searched the connection to the vehicle the witness had seen. Heuerman matched the physical description, the very tall, very bulky, bushy-haired ogre appearance. The final breakthrough came when a surveillance team tailing Heuerman saw him toss a pizza crust into a Manhattan trash can near Bryant Park on January 26, 2023. The DNA extracted from the pizza matched a male hair found on the burlap that wrapped the lifeless body of Megan Waterman, one of the Gilgo Four. Trash was collected from his Massapequa Park residence and used bottles were retrieved. Female hair matching his wife's DNA matched to three of the victims, Brainerd Barnes, Costello, and Waterman. 
Two of the hairs were found on one of the buckles of the three belts he used to tie up Brainerd Barnes's feet, ankle, and legs. Two others were found on a piece of tape and outside the head area of Waterman's body. Another was found on a piece of tape that bound Costello's body. The wife is not a suspect. Investigators looked at the Hureman family travel records and determined that the Gilgo Four were all murdered while Hureman's family was away from home and he was alone in the tri-state area. According to a friend for over 20 years of his wife, Asa Ellerup, Lisa, he showed no red flags, but basically had full reign to do as he pleased for two weeks every year when his wife and kids traveled to her native Iceland. When Lisa was asked if she thought it possible that any of the victims could have been murdered at the family home, she said it was feasible and she could see it because his family was gone for so long. Lisa said that her friend did not seem like a battered woman, but also did not seem very free. She often looked like she was in need of money, saying that the kids never had nice clothes and she drove an old car. Ellerup never held a job. She was always with and therefore her children. Cashiers at the local supermarket where the family shopped said that they were a cheerless and quiet family. Mr. Hureman never accompanied them. Ellerup often looked depressed and the family often paid with food stamps, which was highly unusual for this store in this area. They lived in the same house in Massapequa Park that Hureman was raised in all of his life. The Red House is a few miles across the bay from the beach where the bodies of the four women were unearthed more than a decade ago. Being a lower-income family is hardly unusual. However, keep in mind that the family lived in the house that Hewerman grew up in, and theoretically it must have been paid off, and housing is the greatest expense at a budget. Worn clothes, an old car, food stamps? Yet, he owned a Manhattan-based company, which implies success and well-off clients. This does not add up. Where was the money going? The couple have been married for over 26 years and raised his stepson, Christopher Sheridan, 33, who has learning disabilities, and their daughter, Victoria, 22. Neighbors say that the family was reclusive and enigmatic, and while the block was tight-knit, the Hewermans did not socialize, and that their house was chronically unkempt seemed like an extension of the family's overall nature. The family was not seen outside, and no neighbors recall any other neighbors going inside the home. Late in the afternoon, neighbors report that Ellerup would look like she just rolled out of bed. What was actually going on in this home? Leading a second life and keeping it secret is not out of line with a serial killer. One of the established qualities of that personality is being able to compartmentalize. Much like the man who has a second secret family, a serial killer leads two distinct and private lives. Ellerup filed for divorce days after he was charged with the murders. More evidence that has surfaced include the fact that Hureman used Molina Barthelemy's cell phone to torment her family with chilling, taunting calls after she vanished in 2007. In one of the calls, he even admitted to killing and sexually assaulting her. In addition, using a burner phone and a Gmail account, the LIK conducted thousands of searches related to sex workers, sadistic, as well as child porn, as well as torture porn. He looked up information on active and known serial killers, including the Gilgo Four victims and the investigations around the crimes. He also read about the same track force that was tracking he himself down. In a 14-month period, he had over 200 searches pertaining to the Gilgo investigation. The investigation was kept quiet. They knew their suspect was compulsively searching and watching. They didn't want to give him any insight. And bottom line, they needed to build the absolutely strongest case against him. The move to arrest him was speeded up due to reasons of public safety as he had been closely monitoring the investigation while still patronizing sex workers and using fake IDs and burner phones. Thus he was arrested July 13, 2023. The balance of time must tip in favor of public safety. Thus far, there has been no announcement or conversation as to if Hureman has been or will be connected to any of the other victim remains found on Long Island. Tierney has only admitted at this time that Hureman is tied to the Gilgo Four. In regard to the rest, he said, I'm here to talk about what we did with regard to these four victims, and in regards to the others, he needs to 
maintain investigative secrecy. So who exactly is this Rex Hewerman who slid under the radar for so many years? A registered Manhattan attorney, Hewerman has owned the firm RH Consultants and Associates since 1994. He described the work as general architecture and said he works for clients to resolve issues with the State Department of Buildings. As discussed, Hewerman is a father of two and his daughter is listed as an employee at his firm. The family appeared poor and were basically antisocial. His wife was raised in America but immigrated from Iceland as a child. Hewerman has been years late in paying hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxes and has repeatedly filed lawsuits accusing drivers of injuring him in car accidents. In total, he has had six tax liens and owed a total of more than $425,000 going back to 2005. IRS releases reveal that he has repaid or no longer owed about $215,078 of that, with the most recent being filed in October 2022. In addition, he and his wife, Asa Ellerup, also currently owe more than $81,500 in personal income tax to the state, with bills piling up since November 2020. A gun owner, although the Gilgo Four were all killed by asphyxiation, Hurman has permits for 92 guns and kept them in a very large gun safe. The prosecution are continuing to execute search warrants in their quest to find them all. Apparently, he participated in competition rifle as the only sport he's played. Hewerman, who is now 59 years of age and in tears, pleaded not guilty to six counts of first and second degree murder charges in the deaths of three of the four women known as the Gilgo Four. He is also the prime suspect in the death of Maureen Brainerd Barnes and is expected to be charged. He was remanded without bail. This case is ongoing and the next court date is scheduled for August 1st, 2023. Please stay tuned to find out updates and more reveals as this case continues, as well as the investigation into the other Long Island victims. If you want to hear more, let us know in the comments or just pop in and say hello. We welcome your questions, inspiration, information, and opinions. We would love to know more about you, too. What kind of stories do you like the most? We will have another true crime case for you next week. In the meantime, watch your back, and good night.